I would like to welcome Mas and you all to the live Q&A uh, session of the seminar. Please ask your questions in the box on the screen uh, and we will ask the most popular questions. So if there is one you would like to see answered, please use the voting uh, function. So thank you so much for your talk, uh, Mos. And I will start uh, with one of the questions that is more philosophical. So as a coordinator of the developmental atlas, you are, ama you are doing amazing on working with the experts on the field to drive such an ambitious project. And I wonder if you can tell us a bit of what you have learned from uh, this journey and what will you tell people who is afraid of joining because, uh, for example, potential competition. Thanks, Rosa, and thanks for the opportunity to present today. Um, I think it's um, uh, it's a really interesting, uh, good question, and I can, you know, really in many ways, there's much, much more to be gained by the scientific community working together, you know, collaboratively, supportively, because you just make that, men you know, you make the advances much faster you get greater insights if you have 10 minds on a, pro on, a on a question or on, on some topic than if you had like one or two minds so I think you know that that's fundamentally you know it's about the science and and if you work together with various researchers in a open trusting and uh, respectful where you recognize and how you know uh, credit is distributed, you know, appropriately, then that really creates that recipe where everyone then sees the benefit for now and also medium term and the long term. And that's how communities are formed. And that's what makes successful collaborations. And we've been very lucky uh, in the developmental work that we've done, that we've just got amazing collaborators who are all sharing, uh, really excited about the advances and the insights that we uncover. And therefore, I think share, you will gain far more by collaborating and sharing uh, than to sort of uh, compete. It's not good for science to compete. And um, I think recognition has become more plural in terms of authorships, both at the junior for, uh, first authors and the last authors. Funders are beginning to see the value of team science, recognizing how credit is a portion. And this is how we're going to move forwards in the future. Just look at COVID, how everyone worked together, how quickly we found treatments uh, or vaccines for that matter, uh, and also sharing the knowledge around the world. Thank you. I, I totally agree. I wonder if building on that, do you think we have as a scientist a, res a responsibility to work together to, to deliver the science to really make the most of our funding? Or do you think it's more the funders who should really be promoting this? Another good question. I think it's a bit of both because, you know, it takes two to tango. Uh, there can be incentives from the funders that actually encourages positively nudging this type of uh, collaborative research, uh, supporting the environments that enable this. Uh, and also as researchers ourselves, we need to sort of recognize. And I, and I guess the analogy is if you think about these big types of projects where lots of people come together, it's like building a skyscraper, like the shard, whereas the more kind of conventional way of doing research is a little bit like those garden sheds. And it just takes, you know, it's a different, you know, different types of research. They're both valuable. They both contribute, you know, but if you want to do things at scale, then you do need to have that infrastructure, the framework, uh, you know, the, the, the support uh, within the scientific community and the funders. Uh, so both have to kind of uh, nudge this and support this. Thank you, Vaz. Last question. Um, so I think that was a really important topic, but perhaps switching more to some of the science. Um, how important is the experimental design for the cell atlases? To what extent do you think batch effects can be corrected by computational tools? So I think it's very important, you know, the, the design is very important. And actually this comes back to, to the collaboration uh, question before, because if you, everyone designs the experiment and have, you know, comparable ways of generating the data, that's actually really helpful in terms of integrating the data and minimizing technical effects. 
And in terms of technical effects or what people call batch effects, some of that is actually biology. So while we do need computational methods that can actually you know, minimize technical effects, what you don't want to do by homogenizing and integrating the data is actually throwing the valuable biological information out of the window. So basically throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So there needs to be a, a pragmatic approach as to what are technical effects uh, and what are important biological effects. So, you know, for particularly during development, if you look at something at, you know, six post-conception weeks or 10 post-conception weeks, there are going to be differences, even in the same organ, even in the same cell types. But kind of like uh, mitigating against batch effects has the tendency to kind of like eliminate those differences, those differences that are important biologically. So, yeah, we do need to sort of um, have algorithms that can do that, but we need to be careful that those algorithms are not, you know, blinding us to biology and communities working together to design the experiment so that it can actually allow better data integration will be valuable. Yeah, and so does that, you know, if everybody needs to be kind of using similar tools and, and working on these algorithms, does that mean that the Human Cell Atlas isn't necessarily open to everybody? Or how would someone who's interested in the Human Cell Atlas join if you wanted to? No, I mean, I think, you know, for, for some people interested in Human Cell Atlas, I'll, I'll address the last bit first. Uh, on the website, there is a, I think in my talk, I had a slide that's how to join the Human Cell Atlas and anyone can actually join and express an interest. And what you find is the uh, availabilities on protocols.io, the protocols that have been used and how the experiments have been designed. But also HCA has a lot of um, seminars, virtual seminars, uh, within the biological networks, and then also the HCA meetings where people talk about the studies and how they've undertaken the study. So in, in effect, it's actually very easy to sort of like uh, engage with the existing HCA community for those researchers who are not, um, who have not been so familiar with it, and to then, uh, you know, find out how uh, those researchers are kind of generating the data, analyzing the data, uh, and that can actually be of value for everyone. So it's, um, yeah, so go to the website, reach out to the biological networks of the areas that you're working in, attend our meetings, attend our seminars. There are a lot of, um, you know, Q and A's, uh, and that's one way of kind of um, making the communities work together. Perfect, thank you. I'll hand over to Rosa. Thank you. I will continue a bit on, on the question of, of batch effect and, and data integration, but more into what do you think about sequencing more and more cells? So to what extent is it we should say, OK, we are fine, we are just wasting money by sequencing more cells, uh, or actually you think we are learning more? Um, so for example, if, uh, if you now sequence more cells in the liver, do you think you will get more information that was hidden uh, before? It's a good question. I think there's sequencing more cells using one modality versus sequencing more cells using other modalities, which gives you different types of information. If we took the liver and the fact that we generated data from uh, suspension, so where we have to kind of uh, mechanically dissociate the cells very loosely, but nevertheless, you know, it's a 20 minute, 30 minute sort of like dissociation prior to, uh, you know, uh, analyzing the cells or profiling them by single cell RNA sequencing. Some cells are uh, less amenable to dissociation, for example, the hepatocytes. So we, sh we found fewer hepatocytes than would be expected. And we certainly saw that when we compared it to the spatial analysis of the liver, where there are, you know, there's an abundance of hepatocytes. However, if you sequence more cells using nuclei sequencing, for example, which does not require tissue dissociation, then you would sample many more hepatocytes. So I think it's not just a question of how many cells, but how are you going to profile those cells? Um, and then another way of thinking about it is how much uh, prior information do you have about the composition of a tissue? So if you think that a cell is going to be found at one in a thousand or one in 10,000, then just sequencing lots and lots of cells is just gonna incre you know, increase them marginally to one in a thousand or whatever, and still you know, insufficient. But if you knew some properties about those cells, 
then you could design enrichment strategies that would upsample those cells and you know profile those with the other cells so that you now increase their proportional representation from one in 10,000 to or one in a thousand to now one in 10 or one in a hundred. And so you have many more of those. Uh, and that was a strategy we implemented in the um, uh, adult skin analysis. So we were able to identify innate lymphoid cells, for example, in the skin, which are extremely rare, but because we knew they would be in this sort of CD45 positive CD, you know, class two negative gates, so on and so forth, we could upsample them. So I guess the question about how many cells to sequence has to be taken into account in the context of what tissue you're organizing, what platform you're using, what prior enrichment you're using. And let's not forget nowadays, spatial genomics profiling is also, you know, extremely informative and will allow us to, you know, uh, you know identify those cells in, in, in their in situ location, uh, confirming you know whether we need to study more whether we're missing anything and um, what next to do in terms of informing the atlas thank you uh, and now that you mentioned modalities i wonder if you can tell us what is the modality that you are more excited about <laughs> I don't think there's one to choose from. I actually think they're very complementary. I, I don't know whether I mentioned in the talk about how I view the different modalities as a little bit like, you know, if you were to have a thermal scan, a photograph of you, an MRI scan or an X-ray, they are all giving different facets, but they're all enriching the information that one could gain about one you know, about an individual. So I think, you know, all of those modalities are extremely complementary. Uh, and there is actually no one modality that fits all. But, you know, if you can profile a tissue uh, and, 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 and at scale, at high sing at single cell resolution or sub single cell resolution, uh, and it's, you know, cheap, uh, and, you know, in situ without any other processing and a lot in a sort of like, you know, big size of the tissue that that technology doesn't really exist at the moment, but that would be the technology that I would be most excited about. Maybe something to work on. Exactly, to aspire <laughs> to. Thank you. I will hand it over to Sarian. Thank you. I'm going to change gear altogether and actually ask you about the one, one cell at a time exhibition so I went to the launch and I was really fascinated by the art and I thought it was a really incredible project so I was kind of wondering what the response has been to that project but also how working with the artists maybe you know how I guess how did it affect the way you saw the work and how was it kind of seeing the work through their eyes um, yeah, no, thanks for that question. So can I just check the first was the response of other people to the project? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer the first one, actually. I think uh, generally uh, I found um, that people were kind of like very excited about the Human Cell Atlas. I mean, this is, you know, that they began to kind of like also understand more about what we were doing and the... Uh, public engagement program allowed also people to contribute, the public to contribute to what they thought about it. And one of the interesting things that I found was with regards to organ donation, how some organs are considered more um, or, or seen differently. So people uh, were thinking very differently about donating eyes compared to donating internal organs because they see with their eyes. So there's this kind of special personal attachment to one organ more than the other. Uh, you know, which you wouldn't have understood, but that's very important in terms of understanding the, you know, the background of why people might or might not donate organs. So that's a, a, a kind of like important insight that you learn and, and the response from the public and how they engage. Uh, overall, I thought everybody was like blown away by it. And I think the fact that we never planned for it to be virtual, but the pandemic um, in a way made the, the platform entirely online, the, the, the exhibition entirely online was great because we could reach out to a lot more people. I mean, I accept that not everyone has the internet or, or you know, which is a problem, but this made it global rather than sort of just being specific site uh, for in-person um, activities. In terms of what I've learned uh, with working with artists, et cetera, I mean, I've done that before. What I always find is 
exciting is how you find this shared language. I mean, initially it's almost as though you speak two different languages and then you find uh, a common sort of language that both of you understand and how you then perceive your research from the perspective of the creative artist, practitioner, creative art practitioners, uh, you know, um, like, um, you know, one of the things about um, ways of doing things in terms of, uh, you know, how we kind of like copied each other's movements uh, and, you know, the, 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 you know, the analogy of, of that with how we kind of like, uh, put cells with similar properties together in a, in a kind of like a, 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 a visualization of a cluster, you know, those sort of things were really quite exciting to see how it's different, like how it's different. Do, do you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there was one, one statement that came from a patient that was related to that, that I thought was really um, struck me and it was, uh, about finding a matching donor and and this patient was waiting on the for, for an organ transplant said you know I looked at all the things in my house and the only things that I thought I had matching were a pair of wine glasses um, and, and and it's that kind of um, parallels but also the different sort of yeah. differences that really struck me yeah, I mean, I was quite struck by the artist's kind of interpretations because it's very varied, um, but it was quite fascinating to watch it. So, yeah. um, I will hand back to Rosa. Thank you. No, it was a nice discussion. I, I want uh, to go back to science because I, I have one of the questions that is also close to my heart that is about um, how do you think the environment is uh, shaping the, the human uh, the stem cells? And do you think you can interfere with these intrinsic factors, maybe artificially, and modify the, the cell fate? I know that's a, to me, that's one of the amazing things that we're discovering um, because of the, that there's kind of like the intrinsic properties, but also the environment. I mean, it's sort of like a nature nurture type thing. Uh, and if we can, really understand the sequences of how you know a stem cell becomes uh, the differentiated cell and and this can be faithfully recapitulated as how it would happen in vivo think of all the possibilities in terms of therapeutics uh, tissue engineering stem cell regeneration i mean that that's amazing and, and the atlasing approach, because we've actually taken the uh, uh, framework of where we study everything, allows us to do exactly that, like those the cells in their environment. And in the bone marrow, Peter bone marrow um, analysis is when we actually, that was the first generation of the uh, human bone marrow stroma data, single cell resolution, showing us all of the different cell types that actually shape the environment in which uh, blood and immune cells develop in the bone marrow. So this is going to be valuable insight uh, that that can be you know leverage and facilitate new treatments. I, I don't know if I've actually answered your question. Yeah, yeah, and and now that that uh, thank you so much. I was also wondering like, I mean there are some stem cells that depending on where you find like in the jock sac you won't produce B cells, but do you think or in the bone marrow you will produce more B cells as you were showing? Do you think that? something that is because of the environment, it's or just the intrinsic. And so would that mean that if we put these stem cells in another place, they will start reverting? So they have an intrinsic program, but you can revert that? Or yeah, what, what is your, I guess there is a lot of science to be done. And as you say, it's nurture versus nurture, nurture versus nurture, uh, but um, yeah, to what extent we can, do you think we can revert by taking this cell and bringing it to another environment? So, I mean, I, th I, I, I think actually that's going to be uh, very important to dissect because that's something that we've underexploited. And if you look at our studies where we've taken for the same gestational age stem cells from two organs, they have very different properties. Um, so it's not, it's not an age factor. 
they would have both been derived from the same aleatogonad mesonephros hematopoietic stem cells. So something in the environment of the liver, for example, and something in the environment of the bone marrow that permits uh, one you know, direction of differentiation versus another. So really understanding what cues they're getting from the environment and supplementing that with what stem cells can do is, is going to allow us to really you know, fine tune and engineer the, the development of B cells or whatever else, you know, cells that produce antibodies for when we need it, uh, T cells that can kind of like uh, kill cancer cells or whatever that for when we need it. Uh, all of those things are going to be amazing, but it isn't just the environment. There are also going to be additional environmental triggers that one could use. So for example, uh, a, a good example being, you know, with the skin, if you could get, um, uh, for example, a, a therapeutic cell that enters the skin, but its program is then activated if you shine UV light, which is used for skin treatment, then you have very, very selective with, you know, limited. So it's a bit like optogenetics, but you activate it with UV uh, irradiation, like, you know, UVA or UVB, which we often use. So those are the kind of things that we should also think about in terms of how we uh, modulate uh, function. So it isn't just uh, tissue environment, but also the external environment. I mean, that's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if uh, you can, it's fascinating, but at the same time, sometimes it's scar scary, all, all the things we can do. And do you think we, we should, I mean, we, as a, again, as a researcher, we have this obligation of being aware of the, all the ethics and, and how we communicate, how, how important this is. No, I mean, all of those, I mean, we have to kind of like uh, be mindful of all of those. And that's why the Human Cell Atlas has like a expert ethics working group uh, also engages uh, with a broad range of stakeholders that are, you know, in relevant. Uh, and also, you know, the public engagement, the communication, not just the public engagement, but, you know, in, in other forms of um, media relations. Uh, uh, so all of that is, is part of the Human Cell Atlas. But... I think let's stop for one minute and think about what is scary. I mean, you know, if we were going back 100 years ago and told people that in the future we will be having this discussion on a computer screen or a phone screen uh, and be completely in different geographical locations and talking about this, I mean, that would have been a reasonably scary idea as well 100 years ago. So I guess what's scary now may not be scary in 100 years' time. So, you know... We, it's, it's good to kind of like embrace the changes and the advances um, with what's coming in the future, but be cautious so that, you know, we make sure that they are uh, done in the kind of like best possible standards and also widely communicated and informed by the public, which are the primary stakeholders of any scientific endeavor. Thank you so much. I mean, that, that was uh, fascinating. Uh, so we would like to, to thank Maz uh, once again uh, for her presentation and joining us for the Q&A session and also uh, to the audience who joined this virtual session. So this is the last seminar for 2021 and we'll hopefully be back in the new year with a new series. Uh, but uh, if you can't uh, wait until then, a reminder that these seminars are archived on this webpage for future viewing. And um, yeah, we have been uh, delighted that this series has allowed us to share Sanger science with a diverse scientific audience around the world. So thank you for joining and we look forward to seeing you next year. <laughs>